Well, today we, we begin with Psalm 27. Psalm 27. And uh, prayerfully, we're going to be going through Psalms 27, 28, and 29. It just depends on how talkative I feel like being today, to be honest with you. But beginning in Psalm 27, I'll read Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3, then we'll get into our study. Psalm 27, beginning at verse 1, reading verses 1 through 3. This is a psalm of David, a psalm that encourages us to have trust in the Lord. Psalm 27, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. Every day we have an opportunity to make a decision. Every day we have the decision before us concerning what and who we shall trust in. Whatever we rest our trust in will always be the source of our confidence. The psalmist in Psalm 20, verse 7 said, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. In this psalm, David is expressing his confidence in the Lord. Notice with me, he says, The Lord is my light, the Lord is my salvation, the Lord is the strength of my life. In other words, without God, we will walk in darkness, and we are without a place of refuge. God, in other words, is my fortress. God is the one who takes care of me. Now, this is a man who knows what he's talking about. This is somebody who can write with experience, because David has trusted in the Lord from his youth up. All of us know of David and his special relationship with the Lord. God speaking concerning David said to, uh, concerning him in 1 Samuel 13, 14, that David was a man after my own heart. This is the sweet psalmist of Israel, a man who had a tremendous love for God and an enormous trust in him. And I think one of the more famous stories of David is the story that all of us are familiar with, the story of David and the Philistine giant of Gath by the name of Goliath. When you study the scriptures, you find the story of David and and Goliath in 1 Samuel in chapter 17. In that particular story, just to give you a few uh, thoughts about it and to lay a foundation, in that particular story, we know that the children of Israel were encamped against the Philistines. And the Philistines had a champion, a warrior by the name of Goliath. Goliath was nine feet nine inches tall. For us to have some perspective of that, it would be as if you were standing underneath a basket in a basketball game and the difference between his height and the rim would be three inches. He was an enormous man, incredibly powerful man. As a matter of fact, when he put on his mail, the mail that he would wear uh, and part of his armor weighed 125 pounds. And the shaft of his, of his, of his uh, spear had a, a tip on it uh, that weighed 15 pounds. This man was enormous, extremely powerful, and he had stood before the children of Israel and he had said to them, what's the sense in us having a battle where many soldiers fight and, and many die? He said, let me give to you a challenge. The challenge is really simple. I will fight any one of you. Whoever wins representing his nation, well, that's how it's going to be settled. The Philistines will win or you Jews will win, but send out someone to fight with me. And the Bible tells us that the children of Israel, looking at this nine-foot, nine-inch giant, were trembling in fear. Now, David was a young man at that time, and he was tending his father's sheep. His father sent him on an errand to go and take some food to his brothers, who were part of the Jewish army. And when he arrives, a Goliath comes walking out and once again reissues that challenge to the, to the nation of Israel. And the warriors in Israel, though they were valiant men, when they would see this enormous man walk towards them and issue that challenge, were trembling in fear. Now David's listening to him as he brings forth that challenge, and, and he gets angry. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this man to defy the armies of the living God? Well, they think that he's just a boy and all, and they say, look, you don't seem to understand what's going on here. This is a warrior. David said, I'll take care of him. And they say, well, you don't realize you're just a boy. And this man has been a warrior from his youth, 
There's no way you can take care of this man here. Absolutely none. He said, well, let me tell you a story, David says. Listen, I take care of my family's sheep. When a lion comes or when a bear comes, he says, I take care of them. He said, this man will be no, no more of a problem than one of those lions, one of those bears. Now, a lion and bear is pretty bad as far as I'm concerned, but he's saying that this man is not going to be anything that I'm concerned about. I'll take care of him and, and, and all. And so, um, at first, they, they don't really want him to do that, but uh, seeing that they can't dissuade him, uh, the king, King Saul says, well, here, put on my armor. And David tries on King Saul's armor, and you have to get a picture of that. King Saul was head and shoulders and height above everybody in Israel. He was the biggest man there. He says, you put on my armor. And so you can see Dave, who's a young guy and probably very small comparatively, having this big old armor there. And he hadn't tried the armor. There was no way that he could use it. He says, no, I'll just go with what I know. He picks up five smooth stones, and he goes out to meet the Philistine giant. Now, if you're taking notes, I'm going to read to you right now out of 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 through 50, because the Bible tells us in that scripture, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. This day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And so it was. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David, verse 51. Therefore David ran, stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they took off running. David, back in Psalm 27, David said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I have made a choice to place my confidence in the one who will always give me victory. I have made a choice to trust in the one who will deliver me. He is my light. He is my salvation. He is the strength of my life. You see, salvation provides confidence for those who trust in the Lord. He provides light for our darkness and safety from our enemies. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He said in John 12, 35, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness doesn't know where he's going. When you don't have the Lord, you walk in spiritual darkness. When you have God, he illumines your path before you. He is my light. He is my salvation. He is our refuge and our strength. The psalmist in Psalm 91, 2 says, I'll say of the Lord, he's my refuge, he is my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. So we have options, guys, every day of the week. We have options. Who will I trust in? What will I trust in? Well, David said, the Lord is my strength. I will be afraid of nothing because he's on my side. For if God is for me, who can be against me? That's what he means in verse 2. When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. Now, where is the source of your confidence, David? Well, verse 4, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. The source of his strength is the desire of his heart to have fellowship with God. I have talked to people who have wondered concerning their walk with God. They have no safety. They have no peace. They have no rest. They have no security. 
And they, they, they wonder whether or not um, they even are saved. Well, confidence springs from a relationship with God. I want you to notice, he says, this one thing have I desired. He has this one great desire, which is to worship the Lord and pursue fellowship with Him. That's what he means when he says to inquire in His temple. It speaks of pursuing fellowship with God. He has one holy passion in his life, and that's to behold the beauty of the Lord. And that's how rest, peace, and security are received. It's through having a single-minded loyalty to and a pursuit of the Lord. It comes through rejecting anything that comes between you and Him, rejecting anything that will take you away from Him, from anything that distracts you. You get rid of that. You need to have a single purpose. You need to have a vision. You need to have a sense of destiny in the Lord. You need to know where you're going. That's one of the things that I've been, as a father, attempting to communicate to my kids. I don't know that I've succeeded yet, but that's what I'm trying to do in their upbringing. I have told them one thing. Find your purpose and pursue it. Find what God wants for you and pursue it. Pursue it with all of your heart. Pursue it with all of your strength. When you set your hand to do it, do it with all of your might. But follow God with all that's within you. That's the number one charge that I give to my children in one way or another. I try to model that because that's the pursuit of my life. But I encourage them to have the same for their own. Because when you have a single vision, when you have a something that you're focused on, you can line up your life behind everything else falls into place in its proper sequence. But when you're scattered, when you've got a variety of things that you're trying to accomplish, nothing gets accomplished. And the place of security, peace, and refuge is when you're resting, trusting in God, knowing that He's in control. There's so many people that I've spoken to who don't have that in their life. And I, I, I always can bring it down to one thing. What is your walk with God like? Are you loving the Lord with all of your heart? Jesus said that's what you're to do, right? He said, love my, love God. He, this, this guy approaches him and says, what is the great commandment in the, law, in the law? Well, he says, the first great commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. He said, and the second is like unto it, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he said, listen, I want to give to you the purpose of your life. The purpose of your life, the great law, is to love God with everything. Everything else lines up behind that one single passion. Everything else does. So we need to have a master passion in our life because you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and earthly wealth or material pursuits. It's going to be one or the other. And so you have to make up your mind, like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We have a master passion. We will pursue Him. That's what got Paul through so much. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, said this. He said, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. I want to go to heaven. And that is my destination. And I don't take it lightly. I don't cheapen the grace of God to include all of my sins and all of the things that I want to continue doing I have discovered in Scripture that God has said, I am holy, and therefore you be holy. You need to pursue me with all of your heart. You don't find anywhere in Scripture any call to half-hearted discipleship. If you want to have success in your life, and this, for some people, this, must be, this, this, this will be a very important thing to remember. If you want to have strength, if you want to have success in your walk with God, then make yourself realize that you have to have one master passion. There cannot be any rivals on the throne of your heart. God has to take center stage of everything. And when he does, everything else lines up. And that's why David could say, I have confidence. I'm not afraid of what man can do unto me. Why? Because God's on my side. I have a relationship with him that I safeguard. And by the way, he is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my strength. I hide myself in him and he protects me. 
Notice he says, as we continue in verse 6, he says, Now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Being set upon a high rock places him above all of his enemies. He's saying, God has given me victory, and as a result, I joyfully give my sacrifices to God. I want you to notice that his giving of sacrifice and his singing of praise reveals his genuine fellowship with the Lord. In other words, he's not simply taking from God. He's experiencing a living communion with the Lord. So he says, I've received, but I also give back to him, and I offer him my sacrifices, and I sing my praise to him. Verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, will I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. So he says in verses 7, uh, verse 7, I cry with my voice, have mercy upon me, answer me. David has confidence, yet it appears that his answer to the prayer has not yet come. So he's saying to him, I'm asking you, Lord, to answer. Now notice he says, you have said for me to seek your face, and I have. I have pursued you. You said, seek me, and I have done so. My heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. I desire to have a relationship with you. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 55, 6, and 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. He will have mercy on him. To our God, for he will abundantly pardon. He says in verse 9, Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You've been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. Sometimes when the Lord doesn't move as quickly as we ask, we might feel abandoned, but he's saying, but I'm not. I'm not abandoned. And one of the things that the Lord gave to me many years ago, and somebody here may need this verse, is verse 10. In verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. You know, his love, God's love, is greater to you than the love of your mom and your dad. Always remember that. I have met people over the years who have come and spoken to me and, and have shared with me that their parents are unsaved. And I've said, have you ever shared with them? Have you ever told them what the Lord is doing in your heart? And this is a conversation. It was not an accusation or a condemnation. I just asked the question. Have you ever shared with them? Oh, no. Oh, no, I can't do that. Really? Why? Well, because, you know, they'd kick me out of the house. Because if, if I told them, they'd get upset. I, I can still remember when, my, when I got saved, I have an aunt. My mom used to call the nun, um, very, very strong Catholic woman, my Aunt Julia. And uh, when I got saved, man, I, I went after Aunt Julia. My mom was not happy with that at all. Because, you know, she said, you know, she's going to get really upset and all because she had come over and she had said, so what's new to me? You know, and I said, Jesus. I said, you know what? I gave my heart to Christ. I became a Christian. And, oh, boy, she got upset and everything, and, and I, I wasn't one to back down. And my mom, my mom said, you know, uh, no, you're going to get the nun upset, you know. But you want to know something? Uh, I was speaking to somebody on one occasion, and, and I said to them this. I said, have you, um, have you, would, you, would, you sh would you get saved? Um, and I was trying to lead him to Christ, and he says, I can't. And I said, why can't you? He said, because my mom would get upset at me. And my mom would tell me, I raised you right, and now you've turned from what I've taught you to another path. And so he said, uh, I, I can't come to Christ. And I said to him, listen, I said, are you willing to go to hell for your mother? And he said, yes. And I said, I wasn't. I was not willing to go to hell for my mother, but I was willing to bring my mother to heaven with me. I said, you need to bring your mother to faith in Christ if you will receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. But you want to know something? There are many people who are afraid to offend family and friends. 
Some of you, when I say to you, invite your friends to church, invite your family to church, that the idea of doing something like that is, oh, you've got to be kidding. You know, I can't do that. I know that's true. I can see you right now. I can see it in your eyes. You know, it's, it's true. You know, you don't want to do that. You're afraid to because you're afraid that mom and dad are going to get mad at you. You're afraid to step over that invisible line. I was in church one day, true story. As I was in church, the invitation was given. I was with my cousin, and the uh, pastor given the invitation said, if you want to come to Christ, um, why don't you come forward? And I had a sense in my heart that I should turn to my cousin, his name was Ray, to turn to Ray and say, Ray, if you want to go forward, I'll go with you. But in my mind, I started thinking, no, he's not going to want to go. And besides that, I'm already saved, and they're going to think I'm getting saved, and I don't want to look like I'm getting saved. And it was all a pride thing. It was real stupid. But it was, it was, that was what was going on in my head. So I, didn't, I did not respond to that prompting of the Spirit that I know was the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart. We went home, and he was living with us at that time. We were sitting at the dinner table, and he was right across from me. And he says, you know, David, you remember when the pastor gave the invitation today? I said, yeah. He said, I was waiting for you to turn to me to ask me to go with you forward so I could give my heart to Jesus Christ today. And I have never forgotten that. Now, he came to Christ and is serving the Lord, but I have never forgotten how that I was afraid to take that step. And some of us in this room are too because we're afraid that we're going to be rejected. Well, David made the statement here, and I think it's a very powerful one. When my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. The Lord Jesus Christ calls us to pursue him with all of our hearts, and God loves us more than our parents ever will. Isaiah 49, verse 15, very powerful scripture. The Lord God says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. You know, the Lord loves us, and David says, Even if I were abandoned, God would still take me up. Verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. In your mercy, God, guide me in a safe path that will keep me from falling into the hands of my enemies. Lead me into safety. Take care of me. Protect me from those who are plotting to destroy me. Verse 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And so he continues on and concludes by saying, without faith, all hope is gone. But I encourage you, he says in verse 14, just to wait on the Lord. God's timetable is not mine. God has work that he has to perform in a timetable that is his own. And the Lord has a way of doing that. He has a way of using things and things in our life so that his work can, can be brought to a perfect fulfillment. God doesn't microwave spirituality into us. It takes time, it takes effort, and it takes years. But you wait on the Lord. In the waiting on the Lord is a demonstration that you trust him. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wait, he says, on the Lord. Now we get into Psalm 28. This is a Psalm of David, and he's rejoicing because God answers his prayer. Psalm 28, beginning at verse 1, reading verses 1 and 2. To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. Do not be silent to me, lest if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. 
God, you are my rock, you are the strength of my life, and I need you to answer this prayer, because if you do not answer this prayer, then I am as good as dead. Verse 3, do not take away with the wicked, do not take me away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity who speak peace to their neighbors but evils in their heart. Give to them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render to them what they deserve because they do not regard the works of the Lord nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. So don't take me away with the wicked and the workers of iniquity. When he speaks of wickedness, wickedness speaks of hostility to God. It speaks of guiltiness in sin. The word iniquity is trouble or sorrow and evil. He's saying, I'm not wicked. I'm not filled with iniquity. Don't judge me as you will judge them. But God, as I speak to you in verses 4 and 5, give to them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Judge them on the basis of their lives, Lord. That's a... Now, sometimes we don't realize how strong that is. That's a strong statement. That's a very powerful statement. Judge them on the basis of the works of their lives. I, I can understand that to some degree. When I was, um, perhaps this is inappropriate, and I should be careful as I say this to you. Watching the news, seeing this burned out vehicle, knowing that Americans were in this vehicle in Iraq, knowing that they were burned and their bodies were hoisted and displayed, something inside of me goes off when I see that. And I, and I, and I hurt for the families. You do too. I hurt for the families. And I turn to Marie and I say, that's somebody's son. That's somebody's child, and it hurts. And, and, and I can understand what, what David is saying when he says to give them according to their deeds, Lord. Take care of it, Father. Do the right thing in this. That's a very strong statement, guys. It's a very strong statement. The Bible, if you're taking notes, Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. As a matter of fact, why don't you turn there with me? Romans chapter 2, I'm going to show you something. So you can read it for yourself. Romans chapter 2 gives us insight into this. You know, as you're turning there, one of the more powerful statements the Apostle Paul ever made in another place in 2 Timothy 4.14 was, Alexander the coppersmith has done me much harm. May the Lord reward him according to his deeds. It's a pretty strong statement. Alexander the coppersmith has done me much harm. May the Lord reward him according to his works, according to his deeds. That's a strong statement. May he receive the judgment that is necessary for the things that he's done. In Romans 2, verses 5 through 9, uh, Paul was writing, and he said something I think that we need to read. He says, Romans 2, verse 5, he says, In accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. We do receive judgment for the deeds done in our body. Prior to Jesus Christ, I would have stood before God being judged for what I have done, what my life has been all about. When I receive Christ as my Lord and my Savior, I am now declared to be not guilty, and I'm also given something that I didn't have before, which is the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. So now in Christ... I can stand before God and I am declared to be innocent. I am declared to be not guilty. The doctrine of justification, and we've all heard that word if we've been Christians for a while, that word justification or justified speaks in a forensic or in a legal sense. It is to be declared not guilty, but also it is the sense that you have no guilt whatsoever. God has wiped the slate completely clean on your behalf, and he did that by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
But if I stand before God in my own righteousness, well, Isaiah says, it is as filthy rags. There is none righteous, no, not one, not a single person who is capable in our own righteousness to ever achieve heaven through our works or goodness or anything like that. Because all of us are sinful from birth, from conception is what David said, from my mother's womb, from the time I was conceived, I have been a sinner. So I need a new nature. I receive that nature by faith in Christ. That's what the scripture means when it says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So I receive a new nature, and now I have a new life in Jesus Christ. That comes through faith in him. But if I reject him, if I say I'm going to stand in my own righteousness or my own goodness, well, my own goodness is not sufficient. It takes perfection. And Jesus is the only perfect one. Now, that's a synopsis of Christian theology as it relates to salvation. What we need is faith in Christ who imparts to us his own righteousness, enabling us to go to heaven. But when, turning on back to the psalm, Psalm 28, when David says, give them what they deserve, that's a pretty strong statement. Because he's simply saying, they have rejected you, they're wicked, and they're filled with iniquity. And therefore, he says, deal with them. Deal with them as they deserve. They don't regard, he says in verse 5, they don't regard the works of the Lord. God's works don't mean anything to them, nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. Verse 6, blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him. I'm helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song, I will praise him. The Lord is their strength. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Save your people. Bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also, and bear them up forever. So once again, he expresses his confidence that the Lord has heard his request. Notice he says, God is my rock. God is my strength. God is my shield. God is my fortress. This all describes God's protection and deliverance for him. In verse 9, when he says, save your people and bless your inheritance, he's saying, you are a shepherd as, uh, and, and you can take care of us. You are our king and you will protect us. You are the true king. You are the true shepherd and you will care for us. One of my favorite portions of scripture is found in Isaiah 40, verse 11, where the scripture says to us there that he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. He will take us and carry us in this tender picture, and that's the shepherd that you and I worship. That's why he says, shepherd them also and bear them up forever. Carry them forever. Before we get into Psalm 29, I was talking to my son David. My son David's 25 years old. And uh, he sees the way that I carry my grandson around. And, I've t and some of you grandparents have probably told your, uh, your children this. I've told my kids this. I've said, do you want to see the way your mom and your dad treated you when you were a baby? Watch how we treat our grandson. You are having an opportunity of seeing what we did with you. You know, because I treated my kids like I treat my grandson. My son David, I was talking to him, and uh, sometimes I, as his dad, I, I just adore him. I just adore my son very much. And, and I was telling him, I said, Davey, I said, you know something? I said, you didn't even have to walk anywhere for the first two years of your life. <laughs> That's the truth. I said, you didn't. Oh, he could, but he didn't. I said, if you look at some of the old pictures of us, I said, you will notice that I've always got you on my shoulders. I always had him on my shoulders. I always had all my kids, really, but my David had pictures of me with him on my shoulders at two years of age. And we would walk around everywhere, and I would carry him. You know those old those, those baby carriers that, that they have? You know, they've had those for a long time, haven't they? You know, American Indians had them long before we did. And, um, you know, we just drop our little babies in there, and we just carry them around. I mean, that's the way it was with all four of our kids. And I would carry them around like that everywhere. They could walk, but I would bear them. And you want to know something? I like that image, even as David is saying this, bear them up forever. It's like the Lord carrying you 
wherever he goes. And you know, I, you may say, well, I'd rather walk. Yeah, walk if you'd like. But I enjoy being carried by the Lord. There's just something about the tenderness of that and the picture that is to me a very special picture. And that's what he's saying. Shepherd them and bear them up forever. May they be in your arms and may they be held by you. Carry them, Lord, and show them how much you love them. Now Psalm 29. We made it. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. A Syrian, for those who are taking notes, is another name for Mount Hermon. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says glory. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So David, when you see verses 1 and 2, and he says, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, uh, give unto the Lord glory and strength, David is actually calling on the angels in heaven to praise the glorious king. And it's really an exhortation. The psalm is an exhortation, obviously, to worship God. It's a psalm of praise. When he speaks in verses 3 following concerning God's voice, you know, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. In other words, he's saying God's glory is revealed in various ways, and in, that includes his creation. His glory is, is uh, revealed in the oceans and the thunderstorms. Now, we need to remember that the Canaanites, during the time of the writing, worshipped the God of nature, a God by the name of Baal. And the point he's making here is very simple. He's saying that, that the God of Israel is greater than the false nature God, Baal. He is the God who is the God over the land, and he is the God over the sea. Notice in verses 5 through 7, he speaks of the voice of the Lord breaking the cedars. This is another picture of his power. He can shake the, the mighty trees as well as the mountains with his voice. His voice, according to verse 7, even stirs up lightning because he's the true God over all of nature. Verses 8 and 9, when he speaks of the, the Lord's voice shaking the wilderness, and he speaks of the wilderness of Kadesh. Kadesh is found in southern Judea. It's a picture of, of deserts in general, and he's simply saying that God's voice shakes all of creation and his sovereignty, uh, and in his sovereignty he receives all praise and all glory. And finally, when he says the Lord sat enthroned at the flood and the Lord sits as king forever, the Lord will give strength to his people, the Lord will bless his people with peace. That's an interesting thing that he throws in here, and we'll look at it for a minute as we're about to close. He's saying that God brought the flood during Noah's time because he was king then, and he remains king. And even as he saved Noah and his family, he still saves those who fear in him. That's the point he's making when he says in verse 11, the Lord will give strength to his people, the Lord will bless his people with peace. You remember the story of Noah now, he began to work on an ark in a time when it had never rained on the face of the earth. And for the scripture tells us that he was a preacher of righteousness. And for many years, he labored building an ark. And the blessed silence of scripture doesn't give to us any insight into any conversations that he might have had with his neighbors, but undoubtedly, those who lived amongst him and around him, uh, undoubtedly, they must have believed that this man had lost his mind. And you can imagine as they would approach him and they would say, Noah, may I ask you a question? What is it that you're building? And it was an enormous ark. It was, uh, you know, 400 feet, over 400 feet long and several stories high. And it was the shape of a cigar box with three stories in it and a small roof on the top that he could use to open up the, and, and get fresh air and all of that and to check on the conditions outside. But as they were watching him do that, 
they must have thought that he was an absolutely crazy man. And it may have been that he became the talk of the neighborhood because this went on for many, many, many years. He and his three sons were working there and they would show up and they would say, Noah, what are you building? And he'd say, I'm building an ark. And they'd say, why are you building it? He's saying, because God is going to bring judgment on the face of the earth. Oh, is he really? And what's he going to do? Well, he's going to cause it to rain. Uh, Noah, may I ask you a question? Yes. What is rain? Well, God is going to cause the heavens to open and water is going to fall and it's going to drown all of you unless you get right with him. Hey, we are right with him. And so they'd say, just a minute, and they'd bring somebody over. Could you please tell them the story about the rain again? You know, and he continues to work and continues to work and continues to work and does so for many, many years. But ultimately... God tells him, listen, when you go into the ark, I am going to cause the rain to flood and I will wipe out everything that has oxygen, that derives oxygen from the air. And what I find interesting is the Bible says that God, when the day came and Noah was placed in the ark, the Bible says that God closed the door of that ark. And I've often thought about that as I consider the story of Noah. And I've considered the fact that God closed the door and there is a time when it's your last opportunity and then, it's, then you have no more. And I also think in terms of the fact that Noah, when that rain started coming and the water began to rise, I wonder, now this is speculation, I wonder if Noah hearing the sound of his neighbors banging on the side of that ark, I wonder if that's possible that any may have come and tried to enter in. And yet the Bible says it wasn't Noah who closed the door. It was the Lord who closed the door. And once that door was closed, it was closed for good. And everything that had air in its nostrils died, except for Noah, his sons, his wife, and their wives. And you know, God is planted here right in Scripture for us in verse 10 as the one who is enthroned. And he said, and he's enthroned at the flood. Even as he saved Noah and his family, he still saves those who fear him. That's what he means when he says in verse 11, the Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. You don't have peace when you don't have a relationship with God. You have peace through the grace of God. And I'd encourage you, some of you, not all of you already know this, but I would encourage you as you read your New Testament and you look at the introductions by the Apostle Paul, I would remind you that every time Paul gives his introduction, he will say grace and peace. He never says peace and grace. Notice that with me. Every time he gives an introduction and he uses those terms, it's called the Siamese twins in Scripture. Grace and peace are combined. But he never says to you peace and grace. He always says grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Why does he say that? Because he keeps that order biblically correct. Because without the grace of God, you will never have the peace of God. You can never have peace without his grace. And so he never says to you in his introduction, peace to you and grace. He will always say to you, grace comes before peace. Now you might find this interesting. The word Noah is the word grace. He found uh, rest rather. Noah has found rest. And he is the first person in scripture that the Bible ever says that he found grace in the sight of God. He's the first person in scripture. So Noah received the grace of God to the saving of his family, and he was moved by holy fear to build the ark. And he did that in faith. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews, Hebrews 11, 7 says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Moved by fear, and I want you to see this, prepared an ark by, uh, for the saving of not just Noah, but for the saving of his household. So he was moved by a holy fear because God's word is true. He obeyed what God had to say, not just so that he would be saved, but so that he his sons, daughters-in-law, and his wife might be saved too. That's what moves us. That, again, is why we tell our friends and our family members, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. You need Jesus. Now, one last thought, and then we'll close. 
And you say, really, please? Yes, one last thought, then we'll close. We have been, as a society, brainwashed into believing that people aren't interested in Jesus Christ. We have been told that through every major media source imaginable, imaginable outside of Christian sources. Thank God for K-Wave and KKLA and various Christian sources that continue to present the gospel and present the glory of God through that. Thank God for that, of course. But every major news source that you will look at from the LA Times to ABC, CBS, NBC, to major cable networks, from all the radio talk shows, almost every, almost everyone is not interested in Jesus Christ. Notice and remember with me the response to the passion of the Christ, where immediately people were beginning to say, you know, well, who killed Jesus Christ, and how come this, this movie has been made, and we think that Mel is trying to make some money, etc., etc., etc. And um, And they were trying to... To, to keep that movie from even having an opportunity to be seen from the very beginning. People who had never even seen the movie were coming out against it and saying it's anti-Semitic and, and it's filled with violence, and they hadn't even seen the movie. These are the same people who would argue with you if you said, I don't watch that kind of movie. They'd say, well, what right do you have to make a judgment on something you've never seen? It's the same people, except they now reverse the argument because it's easy to do. They're chameleons. They do that quite easily. And they don't see the hypocrisy of it whatsoever. Never do. But the bottom line is, is we know that multiple millions of people have seen that movie and they continue to go to see that movie. And that shows me something. It shows me there's an interest. It shows me there's a spiritual vacuum in the heart of many Americans. You are living in a season that is, I think, you need to take advantage of because people are wanting to know who is Jesus Christ? You have the answer. And you should take courage and, and you should say, Lord, give me strength. I'm afraid. I don't know if I'm going to say it right. I'm afraid to mess things up. You know what? I still am afraid and you should be afraid of messing things up. But God, give me strength and wisdom and a tongue that, 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 that can be used for your glory. I don't know everything. I don't know Genesis to Revelation. I haven't memorized the scriptures. I, I am not, I'm not even that, 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 that knowledgeable. But I do know this, Lord. Once I was blind, now I see Jesus is alive. He's changed me. Give me strength to tell people that. That's all you really need. It's just a starting place. And you will be amazed how God will say, okay, you opened your mouth, now I will fill it. And as you share, you, you'll sit there going, I knew that? I didn't know I knew that. This is good. You know, I wish I had a tape. I'd put it on TV. <laughs> I'm good. You will be surprised. And I know I have people in here who, who could nod your head in agreement and say, yeah, that's true. All you need to do is trust God. And that's what people don't do. That's all you need to do. Listen, this church... I think has been blessed by God. I know has been blessed by God. I have no doubt in my mind. I have no doubt in my mind. Why did he bless this church? Because he wants to. That's why. Oh, is it some genius? You've got to be kidding. Find one in this church and he'll leave. <laughs> She'll go. No, it's not some genius. It's the spirit of God. It's the work of God. He gets all the glory. He takes care of everything. That's how it works. It's a mystery, except to God. Because he's looking to and fro throughout the earth for somebody whose heart's his, that he might show himself strong on behalf of. Well, if that's the case, then here, here's your question. Why not you? Why not you? Why does it have to be Billy Graham? Why does it have to be Greg Laurie? Why, God, does it have to be Rolf? I mean, <laughs> why? Why? Why can't it be us? Why? And so, look, if you want, if you want to know my philosophy in, in, in a nutshell, I just gave it to you. I just gave it to you. And it's the truth before the Lord. All I do is I say, God, if you want to use somebody... 
I'm here. I'm here. Teach me to trust you, because I know you want to do abundantly more than I could ask or think. But Lord, if you're going to use somebody today, could you please use me? I want to be used by you. Use me, Lord, until you use me up and then take me home. Because I don't want to rust out. You know, I don't want to just sit there just going, oh boy, you know, ministering to the frozen chosen. No, Lord. I, I, want, to, I, want, I want to be used by you. You see, pastors like me do not retire. We don't retire. I mean, that might be bad news for some of you. But... <laughs> But we don't, you know. We just, I am asking the Lord, and, and I, maybe I shouldn't, but I would like to go home when I'm preaching in this pulpit. I would love to just say, and you know what God says? And then, <laughs> bang, you know. And then, take them on out, you know. Kind of freaks some of you out, I'm sure, but boy. <laughs> because that's what I want. I, I want to serve the Lord with every beat of my heart until he takes me home. And so should you. So should you. Why? Can you think of anybody better to serve than Jesus Christ? Can you think of any better boss than him? Absolutely not. There's nobody greater, more loving, more blessing, more caring than him. What a great Savior we have. And so, of course, you are great, Lord. Of course, you give strength to your people. Of course, we praise you. Why wouldn't we? Of course, we give a sacrifice of praise to you, Lord. Of course, we thank you for everything. Why wouldn't you be? You've done so much in our life. And so, all I'm saying is, as I read these psalms, I see somebody who is sold out to God, and he sings praise to him because of what God has done in his life. And that, by the way, is another reason why we come to church on time because singing is not just singing. It's worshiping. And we have an opportunity to worship God with our voices and our heart and to be prepared to receive what God wants to place in us by his word. And so we open up through worship and say, oh, Jesus, I love you. And instead of coming to get, we first come to give. We come to give you honor. We come to give you praise. We come to give you glory. We come to give you everything in us, Lord. And now, would you please feed me so I can leave and give to others what you've given to me. That's how it works.